Here back on Asia Prime, now let's talk about the social condition right now where millions of disabled people have to live with certain disabilities, either mental or physical, and the condition makes it more difficult to have equitable access within a given society. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, Iqbal. And this is a very, very common problem that we hmm. face globally, not only here in Indonesia. Therefore, Metro Globe Network had the chance to interview Sarah Minkara, a disabled activist who was appointed by U.S. President Joe Biden to become the special advisor on international disability rights. She delivers her insights on how society should view disabled individuals. Thank you. Let's take a look. Regarding the issue on international disability rights, uh, Ms. Mankara, we'd like to know more regarding this issue globally. From your point of view, how is this issue being carried out by uh, governments? Good question. As you mentioned in your intro statement, there are 15% of persons with disabilities, so that's 1 billion individuals in this world with a disability. 1 billion. And it's actually estimated it's probably more than that, but let's take 1 billion as a start, right? That's a big portion of our population. And if you look at the reality of persons with disability across the globe, majority of them are marginalized from the educational sector, from employment, from living a full life. If you think about how we see persons with disability in society at large, a lot of time we don't see people with disability through a value-based lens. We don't see them as individuals that we, we expect and we want to make sure they're included and they're integrated into society. And I think that in itself is the, the important aspect in order for us to really achieve the full inclusion and the full integration of persons with disability. We want to make sure that we actually see them as people with value who can contribute. Now, there's been amazing effort um, when it comes to you know, the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, starting out, for instance, in the, in the US, we have over 50 years of experience of legislations, policies, and laws, especially the American with its Disability Act that was established in 1990. But let's take that a step further than the CRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, was, rather, um, was developed in this, in this century. And I think you know, it's, it's an amazing kind of progress that many countries have ratified the CRPD and taking it forward. Now the question is, how do we make sure the CRPD is implemented? How do we make sure that across the board the CRPD actually is is realized? You know, so I think right now there's been a lot of amazing progress, but to be honest, from my perspective, until we change the narrative surrounding disability, we're still going to see the marginalization of persons with disabilities. All right, and Ms. Uh, Mahart. Ms. Mahart. In Jakarta, let's uh, put it down here in Indonesia. Yeah. What, from your point of view, because you have also met a government and also the figures from uh, who are also discussing this issue, and we have also tried to further promote their rights here in the country. What needs to be highlighted from our government, also their implementation here in Jakarta? Good question. So we met with, a, as you mentioned, a wide range of um, stakeholders, civil society from the disability community the National Commission on Disability, the National Commission on Violence Against Women, and Human Rights as well. And also we met with a special assistant to the President on Disability and the Minister of Social Affairs. And the Minister of Social Affairs, Erisma, she's, she's amazing. I was super impressed by her. And her commitment towards, you know, looking at the disability community from a source, from a point of, you know, they have, they have, um, an ability to contribute and to bring forward to society is the perspective that she's bringing forward. And yesterday, last night, actually, we visited one of the vocational trainings that she, um, she they've established. I think there's 16 centers across the country, if I'm not mistaken, and then they they provide vocational training for persons with disabilities to become, um, you know, entrepreneurs, financially independent, which is amazing. And that's what you want. You want people with disabilities to be able, actually be able to be autonomous and be able to contribute to the economy. Um, and besides empowering those with disabilities, one of the main issues that you like to, that you would like to advocate on is women empowerment. And regarding this woman empowerment itself, how do you see the treatment of women, especially the disabled women, globally? It's ultimately we as humans have multiple identities, right? Um, whether I'm first, I'm a woman with a disability, and I think there's been an a lot of progress on the women's right issues, and I think there's. There continues to be progress on that, and we want to make sure that we're also looking at women and disability rights issues. Women with disabilities during COVID were 10 times more likely to face um, uh, sexual harassment and assault and violence than that compared to the average woman, right? 10 times more. 
And when you take that step further, then when people, women with disability want to access justice, mm -hmm. and they want to be able to get justice, they're not, it's not accessible. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not only are you more likely to, to face the, the, this, this violence and assault, then when you want to get justice, it's not even accessible, or people don't take you seriously, or they're not seeing you, and on and on and on. So we really need to make sure that when we're, as a woman, uh, as, a, as a woman's right community, we're talking about these issues, we want to make sure we're bringing forward the woman disabilities um, perspective, and we want to make sure that we're looking at making sure that all of our systems are accessible for women with disabilities. How can we ensure this to be implemented or established, and to actually ensure that everyone in the society comply? I mean, it goes back to, uh, that's a really good question, you know, it goes back to, I always ask the question, so in the, in the Sustainable Development Goals, right, for the UN 2030 agenda, this phrase in itself is, says, no, leaving no one behind, right? But people with disabilities are always left behind in a lot of conversations. Women with disabilities are always left behind. And I always say, let's ask the question, why? Before we address how do we do it, why, why is that the reality? Why do we have systems and spaces and programs and policies that are not accessible? Why, why is the, you know, a lot of times the women's rights movement not accessible for women, women with disabilities? Why are, we, why are we developing justice programs that are not accessible? It goes back to this whole point of society still doesn't see us. They still don't value us. They still don't think what, what it means to make sure we're fully included and we're building a fully accessible space. How do we change that narrative? Work, working with people like you guys, right? And working with media, working with the entertainment, entertainment world, bringing forward these stories. But then also bringing forward the stories not from a point of, oh my god, I feel bad for them, or oh my god, they're amazing, as we call inspiration for, but oh my god, people with disabilities have value, let's make sure we include them. Yes, and the efforts have been carried out, especially like figures like you as well, who is working globally to promote this. Have you seen any, you know, progress from the efforts, especially from your perspective and also your experiences? There's, I mean, in terms of the, the narrative change or... The narrative change, because it, one of the most difficult things is actually changing a mindset of a person, or, and this is, we're talking about a global society. Yeah. There has been change, um, and, but I think there's so much more to do. Because I, uh, all over the world, um, you know, I, I, I've traveled, I used to travel before my role in, in this, in, um, before doing this role, and I used to do this workshop, and I would ask people the question, if you see a pe person with a visible disability walking down the street, what comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Until now, I still hear the narrative, they need help, they're incapable, I feel bad for them, they're struggling, they're suffering, or oh my god, they're so courageous, they're so brave. The narrative is still not a narrative of, this is a person like anyone else, and um, they have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. So. We still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to do. Yes. And now you have been appointed by the U.S. President, um, President Joe Biden, mm -hmm. as the U.S. Special Advisor on International Disabilities Rights. But of course, you have also your personal um, thoughts and also you'd like to approach personally on certain issues. What issues or what progress do you want to see being made during your time in this role? So uh, this is a more of a broader answer. I would say two things. One is, you know, this whole concept of shared responsibility, you know, where disability is not housed within one ministry, like you just housed within the Ministry of Social Affairs or within, you know, a typical, you know, where disability is shared across all aspects of society, where, you know, and people see the reason why this is important. Um, and I, the more that we do that, and even internally within, you know, the State Department is something I'm doing, and how do we get everyone within the bureaus and offices to be thinking about that as well? It's part of their own, seeing the value is part of the important to their own work and their own policy. So this shared responsibility across the board, it, it would be amazing where everyone ends up, um, and it's not like I'm going to achieve this during my time, but the more that we continue doing that, and like, for instance, as we leave this interview, I hope like, uh, you know, anyone that's listening to this say, yeah, I can play a role in including people with disabilities in my own life. If you're a teacher, if you're an employer, if you're uh, a neighbor, community member, ask your question, is the space I'm in inclusive? Is the disability community represented? Is the space I'm in accessible? And accessible not just from an infrastructure-wise, but also cultural-wise. 
everyone, every single one of us have the power to make a difference in this in this work. So we have to work. So we have to start from us individuals, from the very, very small communities. And uh, Ms. Mankara, you have spoken from your time as an advocate, uh, which is empowerment through integration. Can you please tell us, the viewers here in Indonesia, what is exactly empowerment yeah. through integration? Back in the day when I was in undergrad, I actually launched and started my own nonprofit organization called ETI Empowerment through Integration, uh, which is a global nonprofit organization that focuses on the empowerment and the inclusion of youth with disabilities um, in, in countries like Lebanon. And the goal, and we, we address that uh, mission by twofold. By one, um, working on addressing the narrative from the individual level. How do we get youth with disabilities to really embrace who they are, embrace their disability as a strength, build their capacity to be able to be contributing members to society. And then we also address it from a societal perspective where we worked with parents, teachers, community members, educators across the board in the community to change that narrative as well. Because you cannot just go to a person and say, hey, be stronger, be better, whatever it is. Sorry, but if you're in a system where everyone in that system doesn't see you, you're not going to. Yeah. So we really had a grassroots level and build an ecosystem of programs that